years ago when I was a new pastor, I used to take, and I was in a smaller church, and at the time I probably had about 150 people. Uh, I, I taught all the married, uh, uh, the, uh, what do they call them? When you're going to get married, those, uh, the, my mind's blank. Uh, what are they called? Yeah, the engagement. Yeah, all that stuff, yeah. Uh, and so I would take people through uh, six classes on how to have a happy married life. And so um, I don't teach those here. We have a whole group of people we assign you mentors to. They, they do all that now. But I had six sessions. Uh, and so it was, it was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. Um, I took them through, uh, like, the art of communication. Like, how do you talk to a husband or a wife? And I had an actual part of one, one of the sessions was how to have an argument. I heard this almost every single time. We don't argue. Yeah, you are. You will. Yeah, I was there to encourage you. You're going to have an argument somewhere along the line. Uh, I did, and I would always share with them how my wife curbed my brand new Camaros racing tires when I loaned her my car when we were brand new newlyweds, and she didn't think that was a big deal. And so I had my first argument with my wife over what she did to my Camaro. Uh, can you relate? Yeah, so I shared lots of life stories on, uh, you know, how to be a better man. Uh, the wife's more important than the car, correct? The man. I'm uh, trying to help you out here. So anyway, on to my sermon. That's too convicting. So the last two sessions were on finances. Uh, so of all those six sessions, two on finance. Why? Because 75% of all marriages end over money, money issues. And so I wanted to make sure, because no one sat down with, uh, with me and Liz when we got married to explain to us all those ropes. We, we learned all of them the hard way. Uh, so when it came down to finances, uh, are you solvent? So when I would take couples through that, they had a one-page income expense statement. You know, how much do you tithe to God? How much, you know, this, that, where's all your money go? And bottom line is, do you have money to live on if you get married? Because that whole thing, we're just going to live on love. <laughs> Does that work? What say you? No? Okay. And so I had this one couple that was most interesting. Um, they both had great jobs uh, and very stable. And so they presented their numbers to me. And so I was going through the you know, first column, then the second column. And I was going down the second column where the credit card thing was. And it said $720 on there. I'm thinking, hmm, $720 on a credit card. That's not that big of a deal. Um, you can pay that off you know, in a month. And... And so I just moved on down to the bottom line to see, do they have any money? And, and, the, and, and they didn't. They had a negative cash flow. And I'm like, what's the matter with uh, I, what I miss? So I went back on looking at some of the figures. And so I asked, I asked them about the credit card line. I said, um, what, what's the 720 on here, the $720? Uh, whose credit card is this? And she said, it's, it's my credit card. Uh, and uh, I said, well, what's the $720? And she said, that's my minimum payment. That's your what? I mean, minimum payment on what? How, must, how big is the amount? And so I just, I about killed over at the desk. In seminary, they teach you to show no emotion, just, you know, <laughs> stay focused. And, uh, and, and so I, and I sat there and I'm like, oh, okay. So I began to explain to them how to get rid of this debt because this, this can crush your marriage. Uh, so I went through all of oh, how, you, how you do this financially. I kid you not, this, is, this was the response to my pastoral wisdom. She looked at me and she said, okay, pastor, let me just think through what you've said to me here. What you're telling me is uh, that when I go to the mall and I go into Macy's to get into the mall, as I'm walking through there, I can't buy stuff? Hello? <laughs> that is exactly what I'm telling you. In fact, you shouldn't even go into the mall with a credit card. Because you have a problem with materialism and hedonism. And you can't tell yourself no. I'm telling you no. Well, it's really interesting because they, you know, I did the wedding and everything. And they got married and they, they moved away. About a year later, she called me. And I said, yeah, how's it going? Oh, we're having huge issues. Hmm, what's the issue? What would you say? Money. You guys all have the spirit of discernment. Yes. Uh, yeah, it's money. It's money. And I said, well, like, explain to me. Like, what's the issue? She said, well, my husband, unbeknownst to me, uh, had a gambling problem. Oh. So the whole time we're sitting there talking to you about your problem, and he's amening all of that, he's got a gambling problem? Uh-huh. And she said, uh, you know, it, it's taken about a year for this to come out. And she said, in the year since we were married, she said, his, my grandma died and left me a bunch of money. So she said, I took that money, and I stuck that in an account with my name, and I had a special PIN number that he didn't have, because uh, it's my money that my grandma left me. 
And she said, he prowled around the house and found that number and drained that account with online gambling to zero. How do you think that went well for the marriage? Don't you find this interesting? Uh, secret sins can be going on and like the other mate doesn't even know about it until something comes out. Sound familiar? You know, this is uh, destructive. And I can tell you, uh, if I were to sit down with that couple, it's been probably 30 years now, but if I were to sit down with them and ask them, uh, when you both had these particular sins going on in your lives, her secret sin became known, his became known later, I'm, I'm sure that as, as Christians, that that whole time that they were doing those sins, that the Spirit of God was, was convicting them. Because that is what he does. Read John chapter 14, John chapter 16, where Jesus says, I'm gonna, when I leave, I'm going to send you another comforter. Another like me, the Holy Spirit. He's going to come, and what's his job? Well, one of the things he's going to do, he's going to convict of sin. And that's what he does. When you sin, he convicts. So I'm sure that that young man had a, had a terrible year as, as God worked overtime on his life to woo him back to being the kind of man he was supposed to be, the kind of man I told him in my office, you need to be as the priest of your family. See, David had hidden sin, didn't he? He had hidden sin. Uh, he lusted after a woman that was not his wife. So much so, he ended up having an affair with her uh, and got rid of her husband because uh, he was the king and put him in a battle situation where he could get picked off, and he did, uh, and then he would lie about it. See, one sin led to another sin, and he kept all this under wraps, scholars uh, theorized, for about a year that nobody knew what he was doing behind the scenes. And then one day, Nathan Prophet gets the word from God what the sin of the king is, and Nathan the prophet goes and confronts David with a little story and then David then finds out from the prophet, God knows what you've done. You are the sinful man. He repents. But Psalm 51 is about his process of coming back to God, like what was going on as, as before Nathan came to him and, and how he went from a place of being uh, totally disobedient to God to being obedient to God, how to move from no peace in his life to having peace again, from losing intimacy with Christ to getting that intimacy back. You might be the same way. Hidden sin over here that your wife doesn't know about, your unit doesn't know about, no one knows about this thing you've been doing, but it's behind the scenes destroying your, your walk. It's, it's robbing you of your joy. It's the, it's the monkey on your back. You can't get rid of it. Uh, and it's this magnetic sin that keeps drawing you back again and again. It's destroying your, your Christian walk and you need help. And God's going to tell you, well, how to find peace again. The hermeneutical question that arises from David's uh, story in Psalm 51, we'll present it again for you to entertain today. It's how can I secure as a, as a Christian who sins? How can I secure inner peace through a divine pardon? How do, I, how do I get back there to where God pardons me and I can move forward with my life in victory and not have this propensity to fall back into whatever sin X was? So let's review where we've been so far. He's, he's given us two uh, things to, to implement on your way back. This is from David's uh, uh, course on what God taught him. Number one, he said, you must plead to the Lord, verses one and two. And then he said, when you come to God and you plead with him on his mercy, you throw yourself on his mercy, uh, you must be precise because God knows all the specifics of what you've done, your external and internal uh, actions and motivations. So you're not going to fool him by being abstract when you come to him in confession. Just be open and authentic. That's what David did. So let's review the first uh, verses uh, by reading them. He says, uh, this is to the chief musician, this song that David wrote for Israel's worship. It says that's a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. What's he pray for? Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions, plural, because he had many. One sin went to the other. My sin is always before me. Why? Because the Spirit kept convicting him of what he had done. He says, against you and you only have I sinned. I've done this evil in your sight. He owned up to his sin. He didn't blame anybody else. He says that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, he said, my problem started a long time ago. He says, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. He says, as far as, as edemic sin, sin from Adam, well, I, I, I got it when, when my parents conceived me. It's when my sin nature originated. I have nobody buddy, buddy to blame but myself. I, I, I knew I should have done this, and I did it. So what's his way back? Well, he pleads with God for mercy, and he's precise in his confession. Two more things he adds on his road back to God. Verses 6 to 12, which is uh, 
the heart of the passage. Uh, when you study hermeneutics, Bible study methods, uh, there's different uh, concepts that they teach you. One of them is called the law of proportion, that whatever the author spends the most time on is the most important. He's going to dwell from verses 6 to 12 here, the heart of the passage, on you must petition. You must petition God. And he's going to go through 12 petitions that are specific. But before he gets to those petitions that he lays out to God as a, as a sinning child, he, he first denotes what God desires. And notice what God desires in verse 6. He says, behold, and behold in Hebrew is the Hebrew word hen. Uh, it's out of normal word order. So it's like a speed bump. Have you ever hit one and you didn't know it was there? I did this the other night. It got my attention because my, my uh, Volvo S60 is really low to the ground. It rocks your world. That's like throwing a wor word out of nor the normal word order. Um, should have been a verb. Uh, hen is not a verb. Behold is not a verb. And so he says, let me grab your attention, God. I totally know what you desire. What does God desire? What does he desire? You can see it. What does he desire? Truth. Where? Innermost being. And in the hidden part, in, the, in you, in your soul, he says, in the hidden part, you will make me to know wisdom. Uh, he said, God, I know what you want. You want truth. Uh, the, the, the greatest thing for you to understand is what truth he's talking about. Uh, the word here for truth uh, is used in this context uh, to denote moral truth. He says, God, I know in my, in my heart and soul, in my mind, I know you built into the fabric of my being what constitutes morality, good moral decisions. I came into the planet understanding morality and immorality. I can't get away from it. And so the point being, if you understand moral truth in your heart and your mind, then you have better chances of evidencing it in your life, of living according to it. He said, God, I to totally know morally what I should and should not have done with Bathsheba. And it started with my inner man. That's where it should have been. There is a man, I will introduce him to you again, uh, in case you haven't read his books, you need to. Uh, he used to be an atheist. Uh, he studied at Yale. He has a Ph.D., uh, I think in philosophy, he's a Thomistic, like St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, scholar, uh, great thinker. Uh, uh, he's amazing in how he thinks. Uh, J. Bud Zizewski is his name, teaches at the University of Texas in Austin. He wrote a book uh, years ago, What We Can't Not Know. What's the premise of the book? He argues through the entire book that we as humans totally understand absolute moral law. We cannot get away from it. Uh, he's absolutely right. David's saying, God, you desire truth, absolute moral truth. You built it into the fabric of my being, so I am culpable with the sin that I committed with that woman. She, it's not her issue. It's my issue. It started with me. See, science uh, comes along and tells you much different things about morality. Uh, zoologist Richard Dawkins says this about in, well, morality. He says, quote, science has not methods for deciding what is ethical. It's true. See, uh, strychnine, you familiar with strychnine? Yes, thank you. You can talk on our services, like rhetorical question, yes, no, et cetera. Um, so do you cook with it? Why not? Okay, so science can tell you what strychnine is. What is strychnine? Poison. So you, it, science can tell you everything about it. Break it down as a compound. Every, they can tell you everything about it. Science cannot tell you whether you should serve it to grandma or not for Thanksgiving. You wouldn't, right? Because that would be murder, etc. So science has great limitations. Uh, Dawkins is right. Uh, Dirk uh, Paraboom says this about science. He says, uh, our best scientific theories indeed have the consequence that we are not morally responsible for our actions. We are more like machines than we ordinarily suppose. Hey, I'm just a machine. I'm not responsible for it. I'm a product of evolutionary change. See, science cannot tell you what you ought to do. They can say what is, oh, that's strychnine. They can't tell you what you ought to do with it. That's all within the field of religion and theology, limitations of science. Paul Copan, a, 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 a Christian apologist, says this about moral law. He says, and this is what David's talking about, a desire of moral law in the inner being. I, you built it into me, but I didn't obey it. Copan says, if intrinsic value does not exist from the outset, it's emergent in evolutionary thinking. Uh, its emergence from non-valuable processes is difficult to explain. No kidding. He says, it doesn't matter how many non-personal and non-valuable components we happen to stack up. From valuelessness, valuelessness comes. 
moral values, the insatiation of moral properties, personhood, they're intertwined. Moral properties are insatiated through personhood, which is ontologically rooted in the character of God. What did he just say in all that mumbo jumbo? Well, you, you can't get morals from evolutionary thinking. Why? From that which is vacuous and has no value to it whatsoever, you cannot then have high values and morals that spread across all cultures. It's impossible. He's telling you it has to originate in a God who is. Ontological, ontos, the Greek word for being. Who did God say he was to Moses at the burning bush? What's your name? I'm the I am. I'm the ontos. I'm the, I'm the eternally existent one. And so David says, God, I, I totally know I was born with this understanding of moral law within my being. Uh, I've, I, and especially as your child of God, I really knew what your moral law demanded. In fact, if you go back to our study of, of Romans chapter 1, verses 118 and following, Paul says that the godless person, the ungodly, they know the truth of God and they suppress it. They suppress it. He says, God, I have suppressed the truth of moral law, and I did what I did with Bathsheba, and I, sh and I was the last person that should have done that. You, you too understand what God wants you to do, and you, have, you too, if you have sinned with this secret sin, have gone exactly against what God wanted you to do, and you know it. You know it. God says, I need to, I need to get back to a place where you teach me wisdom in my inner person because I've not lived wisely. So notice his petitions. He's going to give you 12 of them. So here they are. Petition one and two, what does he want? Purify me with hyssop. And notice the cause-effect relationship between all of these uh, petitions. Uh, the cause, purify me with hyssop. What's the effect? I'll be clean. Wash me, the cause. What's the effect? I'll be whiter than snow. See, purify, uh, this particular uh, Hebrew verb, uh, is most unusual. It is really the Hebrew uh, word for sin. But here he uses it in a verbal format, and he's basically telling you in Hebrew, de-sin me, God. This problem I have with lust and problem with women and things with my eyes and I can't control myself, the, the way that I am as a sinner, de-sin me over that. Get that out of my being. That's what he's asking for. He ties the word to hyssop. Hyssop, is, here's a picture of some hyssop, uh, was used kind of like a sponge in ancient Israel. And they would cut off the branches and they could dip it in blood for... Uh, priestly duties. So if you go back to Exodus chapter 12, uh, when God sends the death angel uh, to, to Egypt, and he's going to strike the firstborn, he tells Moses, but if you sacrifice an animal and dip it, the hyssop into the blood and paint this on the doorpost of your house, when the death angel comes, he'll see the, the blood which guards your family and he will pass over you. What happens if he doesn't see the blood? He visits your home. And this is a whole other sermon, but your life is either covered by the blood of Christ, the door lentils by faith, or it's not. And, and David, David says, God, I, I need some of that sacrificial hyssop applied to my life uh, that, that you pass away from me. You move away from me in judgment because you have clean, cleaned me. Hyssop was also used uh, of a person who has leprosy, that when they uh, had found healing, they would come to the tabernacle or the temple, and they would use hyssop uh, dipped in blood to bring purification to the leper, that they were cleansed. You can go to all the illustrations in the Gospels where Christ healed people that had leprosy, uh, and it showed he had power over uh, all those organic diseases, but those all illustrated sin. What sin does to a person internally, externally looks like what leprosy does. He has total power to fix the sinner. David says, I need some of that hyssop on my life for you to fix me. So those things that I, I have craved that are not what you want me to crave, they break your moral law, you know, purify me of those. And then he says, wash me. He's now asked God to wash him twice. I mean, how do you wash a stain out of a soul? Dude, you can't. He says, only God, you can do this. And when he says, if you do this for me, if you forgive me, I'll be whiter than snow. Um, years ago, when I was pastor at a church in uh, south of Tucson, Mount Wrightson was south of the little town where I was pastoring, uh, and you could hike from the desert floor up to 9,500 feet up Mount Wrightson, uh, Whipple Observatory, the uh, Smithsonian had an observatory up there. It was an awesome hike, uh, but you went from sand to snow in a day, and coming down that mountain, uh, you, the huge cliffs dropping off thousands of feet, and you're walking in snow that's been packed down by hikers, and the path of the snow was brown with mud, ugly, but the, the snow underneath the beautiful trees was white. And that's where I led my brother-in-law, Steve, to Christ. Because as we were hiking down that mountain, we stopped there. 
And he said, hey, man, I, I need to talk to you. I'm like, what? And he goes, how much do you make a year? I'm like, 20000 You make $20,000 a year. He goes, hey, I'm 40 years old. I got a million dollars in the bank. I have a Jaguar. I have a BMW. I have a house in Solana Beach. And I'm married to your wife's twin sister, and we're not happy. What's the difference between your life and my life? Well, Steve, it's the, it's the path. Your life is that path. Mine's over there, the white snow, because my life's been cleaned, cleaned, cleansed by the blood of Christ. And he trusted Christ there on the side of that cliff. So don't tell me outdoor activities can't lead someone to God. Um, he, he, he found Christ there on, the, on that mountainside. And David says, God, I want to be white like that snow underneath those bushes over there. My life is, I've messed it up. Would you please make me whiter than snow? God is waiting to make you whiter than snow no matter what sin you've committed, but you must come to him and petition. That's what you need. Verse 8, he says, let me ask some more things, God, in my petition. Make me to hear joy and gladness at the bones which you've broken rejoice. Uh, translated um, petition uh, number uh, 3, God, I, I want to hear you tell me that, you, that you're going to forgive me. I want to hear those words. Uh, in my soul and be glad about it. And the bones which you've broken, uh, they want to sing out to you in praise when you have forgiven me. Um, when a child of God sins, uh, the father uh, disciplines that child. Uh, Hebrews 12, 1 to 5 tells you that he does. Uh, whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Every child. And if you have children, you understand this because they come into the world with a sin nature, do they not? They do, don't they? Whoever sits around and, okay, today we're going to have a class on lying. We're going to have a class on being stingy. Do you ever teach your children that stuff? They come into the world this way. And so when you, when you look at what David's asking for here, he's saying, hey, look, God, I know you, you've disciplined me. Your guilt has been heavy on me. I know I need to repent. In fact, my guilt on my conscience for what I've done is so great, it's like it's crushing my bones. Please forgive me so my, jo my bones can get reprieve and rejoice. Isn't that what you want? Freedom in your soul? Five and six, what's he ask for? Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. What's the worst thing that could happen when you sin? God's staring at you, and he knows exactly what you did. This is anthropomorphic language. Anthropos, the Greek word for man, uh, morphe, uh, the form, the form of a man. Does God have a man's body, the heavenly father? Yes, no, no. No, he's spirit. You have to th speak in anthropomorphic language to describe God. But he's saying, you know, God, I know in all your greatness of the Trinity, if it's possible for you to turn your face away from what I've done with Bathsheba, then I can get forgiven. Because if you look at me, you're holy. And if you're holy, you'll, you'll judge me. And I felt your discipline on me as I've, since this whole year, I need you to just, could you look away? Could you look away and forgive me? And then he says, blot out my iniquities. He's asked this before, now he's asking twice. But he switches the Hebrew word here. Before it was transgressions, now it's iniquities. Uh, why is he using that word? Uh, the Greek word, uh, not the Greek word, the, the Hebrew word, uh, aon is the word, uh, means to be completely crooked as opposed to straight. He's saying, God, I know I was not supposed to have her as my wife. She was married to somebody else. I, I wasn't even supposed to lust after her. I did. I shouldn't have done that. I committed a crooked offense from what the law said. Because the Ten Commandments were very clear, were they not? You're not to co covet somebody, something else, right? And you're not to commit adultery. He said, God, I, I've broken those two commandments uh, of many of them. Because I've done that which is crooked. See, when you sin, you know God has told me to do this, and you do this. C.S. Lewis, uh, as you know from mere Christianity... Uh, as an atheist and an evolutionist, was saved based on this concept of crooked versus a straight moral law. Uh, writing in mere Christianity, he says this, because he, he, he couldn't stand the Nazis and what they were doing in the war to the Jews. And so he, as an atheist and an evolutionist, wrote this. He says, my argument against God was the universe seems so cruel and unjust, but how I got this idea of just and unjust? Uh, a man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line what was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? He said, I had no grounds to call it unjust as an atheist. Where'd that come from? Where did that come from? God. Uh, this eventually led him to, to, to God. See, God understands the difference between straight and crooked when it comes to truth and morality because he's the essence of measurement. David says, blot out all of my iniquities. Why? Because he said, God, I know you're keeping track of my activities 
and in your ledger, I want that to be empty on that day I stand before you. Don't you? Eighth, seventh and eighth petition. Very interesting. He says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, which is what you crave when you sin against God and shake your fist in his face. You know your heart's all stained and you need a new heart. Create in me a new heart, O God. He uses the word here, uh, God is Elohim. Uh, plural, I am Indians in Hebrew are plural. Um, but we know that God is not plurality because that would be polytheism, correct? Correct? Uh, but we know from the great Shema of Deuteronomy 6.4 of Israel that God is one God. Behold, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Echad in Hebrew. Uh, he's one in complexity, is he not? In his greatness. Uh, and he says, you are the creator, Elohim. Uh, could, you, could you take me as your creation who've stained my heart like beyond my ability to fix it, and could you give me a new one? <coughs> the name for Elohim appears all through Genesis uh, chapter 1. He's the creator. It's in chapter 1, verse 1, verse 2, verse 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 14, verse 16, verse 17, 18, 20, 22, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 31. I counted them all. <clears throat> That's what I get paid for. Why in the world did he use Elohim so many times in a row in the first chapter of Genesis? Because <clears throat> he's saying, God, you are the God of great complexity who has made all this complex order. I keep using your name, that great pluralized name that speaks of your oneness in the Trinity. And David's appealing to that God, and he's saying to God, you are so great that if you can create all this complexity out of nothing by the word of your mouth, you can fix me. You can fix me. I'm going to need some water. I mean, I'm, I'm figuring that out. <coughs> I'm forgiven, or they're getting it. <coughs> thank you. Sounds like I was forgiven, but thank you. Um, isn't this awesome? That no matter what the depth of your problem was, pornography, alcoholism, meth, whatever it is, God can reach down <coughs> and change your life. My best friend spent half his life in San Quentin. Alan Reasoner was his name. Uh, he died in a motorcycle wreck. Um, great, great man of God. Met Christ in San Quentin. Got saved there. His Bible, as I've told you before, sits on my desk to remember Alan. Uh, you name it, and he did it. Thanks. Could I have a Pepsi, too? And a <coughs> Just saying. Thanks, Ben. Talk among yourselves for a minute. You never do what I say. It's kind of scary. But... <laughs> Thank you, Ben. Um, and Alan, uh, you know, life of drugs, dropping acid, all that he did. To see a Alan as a new man in Christ was an amazing thing. When I was with him, working with him as a landscaper when I was first married, God took a man with great sin and forgave him and restored him and, and used him greatly. God can do the same thing for you because he's the creator, has that kind of power. Uh, Michael Denton is a geneticist. He talks about how great God is. He says this about a, a cell. He says, between a living cell and the most highly ordered non-biological systems, such as a crystal or a snowflake, there is a chasm as vast and absolute as it is possible to conceive. Even the tiniest of bacterial cells, weighing less than a trillionth of a gram, is a veritable, a micro-miniaturized factory containing thousands of exquisitely designed pieces of intricate molecular machinery, made up of altogether of 100,000 million atoms, far more complicated than any machine built by man and absolutely without parallel in the non-living world. That's a geneticist. Why are we talking about that? Here's the way I look at that when I read that in science, because I, like, I love reading science books, because I, re <coughs> I read them and I think to myself, that God who can make that kind of machinery at a level I can't even see, <coughs> and you don't think he can handle your sin? What's a, sure he can. He can take the complexity of your sin that you've committed and totally give you that new heart that loves him again. He can totally help you. You just have to come to him. And then he asks for a steadfast spirit. The Hebrew word here refers to literally um, pillars put in a giant stone home to hold it up. And David says, I, 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 my spirit is not steadfast, especially when it came to Bathsheba. And God, I, I need those pillars put back in my life. If you ask him, God will give you those pillars again. Petition number 9 and 10. He says, don't cast me away from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Is this possible to be applied to a New Testament saint? Answer, no. 
Because in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was given to four individuals temporarily, prophets, priests, kings, and artisans who built the tabernacle or the temple. They had him for a while, and he could be taken away. David had lived to see the Holy Spirit taken away from King Saul, Israel's first king. When King Saul continually sinned against God, God removed the Spirit from him. David watched what happened as Saul slipped into his insane mode. And David says, God, I don't want you to cast me away as you did to Saul, and I don't want you to remove the power of the Spirit from me as a king and a politician. I need you. I need you. For the Christian in, in our day and age, your sin grieves God. But he's not going to leave you. Uh, I believe in eternal security because it's written all throughout the New Testament. Ephesians 4 is a case in point. What does Paul say? <clears throat> Speaking to Christians in Ephesus. And these, by the way, if you, re if you were to read this in Greek, all the, all the uh, commands here are negative commands wedded to a present tense verb, meaning the actions taking place. They were doing these things, the Christians. Like what? He says, put away what? Lying. Lying. Let each one of you speak truth to his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Don't give place to the devil. If you're having an argument, deal with it in a righteous way. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give to whom has need. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. If you filthy language as a Christian, don't do that. Your mouth should be used for what is good and necessary for edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And then he throws in this verse. He's speaking to who? Christians. He says, and do not, do what? Grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Why? By whom you are sealed. Until when? Until that your next sin? No. He can't go anywhere. Because he's your promise ring. Read, read chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. You got the Spirit when you trusted Christ the Savior. He sealed you. 1 Corinthians 1, Chapters 12 and 13, he baptized you into the body of Christ. He doesn't unbaptize you. How many sin would it, sins would it take you to be taken out of the family of Christ anyway? How many? One. No, Paul says here, you as Christians, stop doing all these things. Why? You're grieving the spirit of God because he can't go anywhere. He's promised <clears throat> to be your seal to you see Christ face to face. He can't go anywhere. And so you as a Christian are, if you sin and do not confess that, you have that secret sin, be what it may, you are for sure grieving the Spirit of God. And he is, he is not static. He's dynamic in how he deals with his children. First it says in First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19, that you can not only grieve the Spirit, you can quench the Spirit. Paul says don't quench the Spirit either. Because when you sin and don't confess it, you truncate the power of the Spirit in your life. Are you doing those? Paul says in, uh, in our terminology, in light of uh, what David prays, uh, don't live in such a way that you squelch the Spirit's power in your life. 11 and 12, logical prayer, restore to me what? Well, that, what, that you lost, that, what'd you lose? Joy. Joy is my salvation. And sustain me with a willing spirit. What did you lose when you, you, you willingly walked into sin? Be what it may. You for sure lost the joy of your intimacy with Christ. He says, God, take me back when I was younger and loved you and followed you and listened to you and was careful what I did with the ladies and I, was, I, I lived morally straight. Take me back when our relationship was just tight and, and God can. That's the wonderful thing. You, the devil's going to tell you, if you ask forgiveness, God's not going to restore you to that intimate place. Don't believe that. He will. And he says, give me a willing spirit. Why? Because he didn't have a willing spirit. He lived according to his will. That's what got him into the problem in the first place. He said, God, give me a spirit that's willing. How do you get back to that place of peace with Christ? Number one, plead with God. Throw yourself on his mercy. Number two, be precise in your prayer. Number three, petition him. Lay out your petition with specificity. Last thing, well, you must promise. You must promise. There must be change. Notice what he says. He says, if you forgive me, he says, then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. This is the, he's going to, of three things he says he's going to do, this is the first one. He says, God, if you forgive me, I'm going to use my sordid past and what I did with this affair, the adultery, the murder, the, all that I did, I'm going to use what I've done in my sin that you've forgiven me for, and I'm going to teach sinners not to go down that path. I mean, haven't you done this as a parent when you're talking to your children and, and you see things going on and you've lived life long enough to know, son, you just don't do that with a girlfriend because that leads to this, which leads to this. And they look at you like, what do you know? 
a lot. And David says, hey, look at my life. Uh, I will be the first God to stand up and say to others around me, don't choose that path. It leads to all these other bad things. When you come back to Christ and he forgives you, uh, it, it's you stepping forward to promise that you will use your life as a mouthpiece to all those around you. Will you do that? Number two, he says, I'm going to sing privately and publicly of your greatness. Verse 14, deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation. Then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips that my mouth may declare your praise. What happens when you get free? Well, you naturally want to sing of God's grace in your car, <laughs> you know, at home, privately. Songs pop into your mind. You sing in worship. I mean, that joy's back. And he says, God, I will, I will promise that where I, wherever I'm at, privately or publicly, I will make everybody know about, about your great grace to sinners like me. Will you do that? Third thing, he says, I'm going to stop thinking that uh, outer religious actions are what procure your favor. Notice what he says, verse 16. You do not delight in sacrifice. Otherwise, I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are what? What's God really looking for? A broken spirit, a, a broken and contrite heart. Oh, God, he says, you will not, us not despise. See, God gave us the, the sacrificial system in Leviticus, chapters 1 to 7. And David says, I, I t I'm, not, I'm not telling you, God, that that's not important. Sin must be covered by sacrificial blood. But he says, I could take all the peace offerings that I could amass with all of my wealth and present a thousand peace offerings to you, but unless my heart was broken over my sin, they would be worthless. How does that translate in the New Testament age? Uh, simple. You think that all these things that you do, these religious actions that you do externally, will make everything okay with God when the heart's the problem. This isn't a, a person who has sinned who comes before God's throne and says, oh, well, you know, I really shouldn't have done that. And, and sorry about that, God, and thanks for forgiving me. Yeah, I'm moving on. No, this is, he says it's a broken person. You weep over your sin. You are shocked over your sin. And there's that brokenness where you come before God to say, God, forgive me. I cannot believe what I was thinking. And he says, you will not despise somebody who comes to you that way. It's putting your heart first, the religious stuff later. What's a natural byproduct of a, of a saint that comes back to God? Verse 18. It says, by your favor, do good to Zion, build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in the righteous sacrifices and burnt offering, whole, off, whole burnt offering. Then young bulls will be offered on your altars. So he's saying, if I, as a, he's a politician, he's a king. He's saying, what's wrong with my nation? He said, I look around at my nation, it's a moral mess. What's the problem of the nation? It's the king. He says, God, because I have done this sin, it has destroyed the moral walls that protect my nation. And because I've done this sin, people have followed suit based on my activities. So he said, God, I, I repent of my sin. And when I repent of my sin and I come back to you as the, as the leader, then you're going to bless my nation. That the morality th that's not there around me will be built up because I got real about my walk with you. What does America need? I mean, are you connecting the dots in David's life? What, what do they need? Do we need, we need another president, another platform, or this, or that? What do we really need? God. That's what David's telling you. He's telling you, the issues in my country were because I lived in secret sin and didn't come clean. What could be the greatest thing that could happen in a nation but for the leaders, for the people, starting with the house of God, to come forward and say, God, I for, here's my sin. Forgive me, because David says, when you confess, God then builds the walls of the nation. That's what I'm praying for. In your life, my life, in the lives of our leaders, that God does a great work in us, starting with us, because when we change and get real, then it just bleeds over to the rest of the nation. I pray for all of us that we would get real with God and confess and come back to him, and he will always be standing there waiting to receive you.